Great. Welcome everyone. Uh, we were just waiting for a few more people to come in, uh, but we'll get started. So again, a very warm welcome um, to this evening's webinar with the Perimeter Institute uh, for Theoretical Physics. I believe there was a slight mistake in the email reminder that was sent to everyone. So let's just clear it out right now. Uh, this is not nuclear physics we'll be talking about tonight. My name is Eddie Grenmeyer and I work for EUN and the Scientix project and I'll be your presenter tonight, or at least I'll be presenting the presenters. Um, we'll have two people with us, Rocio and um, Miriam, who will be moderating the event. So they'll be available on the chat uh, to take your questions, uh, answer any queries you have regarding the technology and how to post your questions. So do not hesitate to make use of the chat. We will not be interrupting um, the event for questions during the presentation. So if you just want to make sure that your questions go onto the chat, we will have a Q&A session at the end uh, to take those questions to our presenters. So a um, few housekeeping rules. The run number two is the fact that you will have to um, sign up our attendance uh, sheet and give us some feedback uh, on the SurveyMonkey um, form that will be shared with you in the chat uh, at some point throughout the webinar. Make sure that you do fill that in because it is a uh, only upon completion of that that you'll be able to receive your certificate for the evening. So it's quite an important thing. Now, uh, without further ado, let's uh, meet our presenters. So we are joined tonight by Dave Fish uh, from the Perimeter Institute uh, for Theoretical Physics in Ontario, Canada. Uh, Dave has been a high, high school physics student, a teacher, sorry, for over 25 years, and he's now the teacher in residence of the Perimeter Institute. He's been um, really, really important. He has contributed to the creation of the production of most of the Institute resources, uh, and he has led workshops uh, in physics at the local, at the provincial, national and international levels. Uh, Dave will introduce to us the um, resources that are available and what the Perimeter Institute is about. Uh, he'll take us through a quick tour uh, and he will um, tell us a little bit more about how and why to use their resources. He will be joined by Michael Gregory. Uh, Michael is from France and he is a um, teacher that has been um, teaching science to students for a very long time. He is all about uh, Scientex because he is actually in-house. He is one of our Scientex ambassadors, so we're very happy to have him here tonight. And what he'll do, he'll tell us a little bit more about how he uses the resources uh, for his own practices. So uh, I believe that we are now ready to go. So if our presenters are good to go, welcome. Thank you for being here. And Dave, you have the floor. Thanks a lot, Eddie. We're uh, super excited to be here. And uh, I want to share some of the exciting stuff that we're doing here at Perimeter and uh, hopefully um, invite you to participate in some of the work that we're doing. So without further ado, let's walk through a little bit about what Perimeter is all about. So Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics is located in Waterloo, which is about an hour west of Toronto. And this is a beautiful building. It's something we're really proud of. I'm actually in the building today for the first time in a long time. And um, I really, um, it's a special place. We are not associated with any, directly with any university. So we are independent and that gives us an incredible amount of flexibility and um, the ability to adapt very quickly and to do different things and special things. Um, Stephen Hawking is one of our early patrons. Um, and in fact, that picture that you just saw is called the Stephen Hawking Center. And a quote from Stephen Hawking, the Perimeter Institute is now one of the world's leading centers in theoretical physics, if not the leading center. We have managed here in about 20 years to accumulate some of the top theoretical physicists and to do some really uh, impactful work. And we're really proud of the effect that we've had as a small new institute. Um, give you a little flavor for, the, for the, uh, the history of where we came from. We're about 20 years old. In fact, uh, this year is supposed to be our 20th anniversary. We're gonna have a festival, but COVID has kind of delayed that. 
Um, we started about 20 years ago with the vision of Mike Lazaridis, um, who is, depending on who you talk to, the, sort of the, the uh, original inventor of the smartphone. So he's Bla Mr. Blackberry. Um, and so Mike made a lot of money with wireless technology. And one of the things he realized was that everything he made came from the work of people like Michael Faraday and Heinrich Hertz uh, 100 and 150 years previous. And he looked around and he kind of said, you know what, nobody is investing in that kind of fundamental research anymore. If you go to a government for funding, they ask you, what are you going to do with it? What disease are you going to cure? What, uh, what tool are you going to build? And theoretical physics does not have that kind of punch. You, who, what do we know? We don't know what's going to come from studying black holes. It's just a really important thing to do because that's what drives the fundamental physics is what drives all innovation. And so uh, Mike put $150 million of his own money down and he said, we're going to build an institute and we're going to make a really special place for physics and we're going to keep it independent so that it can it can do things differently. Uh, that picture you see there is, is our first real home. It was actually a, it's an old restaurant and bar. And so it, our, our institute started in a really, with a cool vibe where uh, we kept the original bar upstairs and we turned it into an espresso bar. We took out the beer taps, but we put in a great big espresso machine because theoretical physics drives on, on coffee. And the feeling there was of intimacy and of collaboration. And the, uh, we, we put blackboards up in the pool room. We kept the pool tables, but we put blackboards up on all the walls so that people could stand around and talk and collaborate and, and exciting things started to happen. And we were able to recruit aggressively, especially among the postdoc community. Um, we, we decided early on that to invest in postdocs is, is key because that's where a lot of really good innovative physics happens is at that level of you got your PhD, so you know you've been trained, but you haven't been bogged down. You still have creative ideas. You're still, uh, you have your own thoughts. And so what we would do is go out to postdocs and say, okay, how would you like for three to five years? Come work for us. No teaching, no university responsibilities. Uh, just do your research, pursue your passion. And so we we very quickly were able to, to um, recruit some very, very high-end postdocs. Um, from the very beginning, Perimeter has had a threefold mandate to do research, to do training, to do outreach. So I'm going to really quickly go through a little bit of the research and training. I want to focus on the outreach part. This is a, by, and I want you to understand this, outreach is not just something that we kind of um, do on the side. It is part of our DNA here at the Institute. Outreach is foundational to what we do. So what is the research that we're doing? So theoretical physics, we have people here who are working in particle physics, quantum fields and strings, quantum gravity, quantum foundations, quantum information, mathematical physics, cosmology, strong gravity. However, it's very unlikely that you will find one researcher who is in just one group. From the very beginning, we set up that this is to be collaboration you are to integrate with other people from other groups. Um, we don't have a section of our building that is the string theory group. If you're studying string theories, you might very much be right next to somebody who is doing strong gravity or cosmology in the next office. And that's deliberate because we want you walking down the hall and bumping into somebody who is approaching different problems or maybe approaching the same problem using different techniques. And it's really in that uh, the intersection of, of uh, disciplines that we think the big steps are going to be made. Um, I remember listening to one of our researchers who, who, when somebody asked him, what you know, what do you study? He goes, well, I was trained in particle physics, but I use string theory to handle questions of cosmology now. And that's really gives you the, the sense of what our institute is like. Um, we really, we are, are it's very difficult to pin down our researchers and say, what do you study? They're studying all sorts of things with all sorts of methods, and that's really important to who we are. Um, we are a very um, international group, even though we're located in Canada, 
if we were to take a look at who are who is doing the research, we have recruited around the world and we have brought people in and it's fantastic when the building is open and, and full. Um, you hear all sorts of languages and accents and it's a fantastic place to be. Um, it's been difficult. We have some things where in terms of recruitment, we do we do things a little differently here because we're independent. We have some flexibility. So in the early days when we were trying to build up an, a faculty, um, we, we had to be somewhat aggressive because if we're competing with Vienna, well, Waterloo does not have opera. We do not have or well, we have a symphony, but it's not very sophisticated. It's a small town and so we had to provide some of that thing, some of those things, some of the, the culture and some of the opportunities that people are looking for. Um, and so we really have a, a, a neat um, culture up in our institute. It's not just a building. It's just not somewhere where you go and work. It is also a, a place where we have very top end artists come in and perform where we have um, opportunities for you to bring your family in for, for meals every week. We have a, pu a pub night where it's a family night basically in our bistro. Um, we also are trying very hard um, to change the way physics is done. And one of the ways that we're trying to do that is with our ability to be uh, independent and flexible, we are making some really concerted efforts to deal to address the diversity issue in physics. And so one of the things that we've been doing is we have what are called the Emmy Neuther Visiting Fellowships, and these are opportunities for um, young or mid career women to come to the Perimeter Institute for a year or two and just pursue their interests. And what we've learned over the years of doing this is um, that there are there are some things that you maybe don't notice but are really important. So one of the things with the, the visiting fellowships is um, it, when we offer a fellowship to somebody, we give them up to two years to respond and say, yeah, I'd like to come, but it's going to take me time to arrange things because society is still in the situation where women carry more of the domestic load, things like childcare, things like schooling and um, what we found early on was that if we want to, um, we, we have to respond to this by giving more flexibility. And so uh, one of the things we do with these visiting fellowships is we listen very carefully to how can we make this work and what can we do? And again, because we're independent, we don't have the bureaucracy of a big university. We can we can make changes. We can we can do things on the fly. And so we've, we've done that and we've been very successful. We've had over 50 um, women come in on these visiting fellowships and, and they spend um, uh, one or two years just pursuing their questions, collaborating with people in the building and and uh, and progress and uh, moving their work along. Um, we also have a, a leadership group called the Emmy North Circle, and these are um, women who direct our our ideas and, and our, our initiatives in this area. We have a very different graduate program. We have a master's program where it's very intense. It's one year. It's very competitive to get in, but it's not so competitive once you're here. Once you're here, it's about collaboration. It's about learning the skills of a true, truly the skills of a researcher. And we bring these students in and we we teach them in modules and we bring the very best people in the world because we have them they teach the courses so you might you you know you, you might have some stuff on black holes and mathematics and and roger penrose is the person who's in town or we we uh, you know, we basically we break things down and it's, it's so exciting for these students because they get to interact with the very best minds in the fields. And the emphasis is on them growing and developing and seeing is research something that they want to do. And again, it's a very international group. Um, we try our we, we aim for 50 50 in terms of the male female split, but we aren't 
we, we aren't committed to that. It's not like part of the program. We usually uh, um, achieve about a 60-40 split. And that, again, that's a big part of our commitment to increasing diversity is that we try to give uh, opportunity to people who are committed to learning about physics. And so you can see here, this is a class from a few years ago. Um, you can see great diversity in terms of where they're coming from. And it's, it's a really exciting program. They come together, it's very immersive. We've, we've had a program going online through COVID, but it, you know, it's like everything else, we're doing the best we can, um, but it's, it's not quite the same if they don't get to come here. Uh, and now finally, what I'd like to talk about is, is some of the outreach stuff. And this is where my heart is. This is where I've been involved in Perimeter since the beginning, is with engaging the public. And every three to five years, we host a festival here at our building. And we invite the public in and we, we try to expose them and ex inspire them it, with the world of physics. And this young, this young guy is actually using his, he's using a toy where it uses brain waves to, uh, to activate a little drone. So he's actually controlling this device with his mind. And so we were just trying to, to show them some of the things that are going on. It's not just little kids that get inspired. We also bring big kids in. Um, I also wanted to show you this because these are some of my students. I brought them in and they're playing and I can guarantee you these are not the top students in my class, but you can see that they are drawn in. And we find this, that when we give students the opportunity to interact with, with quality physics, um, they learn, but they are also just inspired. And that's a, that's a key part of what we want to do with our public engagement. Um, we, have, we host public lectures. And this is a picture of uh, what's called the Massey Lectures. A few years ago, Neil Turok, who was at that time was our director, was chosen to do this national tour of lectures. But we've been doing this for, for almost 20 years now. We host monthly public lectures and we sell out whatever auditoriums we use. Now, the, the tickets are free, but um, they sell out almost instantly. We bring in some of the top names and, and everybody wants to be there. Um, one, one week, we, one month, we found out that um, as part of the deal with, with uh, trying to get more students in, Perimeter would give uh, advanced tickets to some of the local teachers like myself so that I could guarantee that my students could get a ticket. And it turned out that we, we found out that some of my students were, were selling their tickets online. They were free. But the, the demand, the, the thirst for attending these lectures was so high that they were actually scalping these tickets. Can you imagine that? That somebody is scalping tickets for a physics lecture. And that's what we have found is that there is a tremendous desire for learning. And uh, I want to point out that there's a, a link there that um, we have all of these lectures are available online. And you can go through and find these lectures and, and see what different people have done. Um, we've had a, a great uh, time of it. We now are changing the format a little bit. We've moved into a smaller um, auditorium that is wired for online stuff. So our, webs uh, our lectures are now much more focused on going live. So you could tune in Although for you, it would be a little awkward. It's we have the lectures at about seven o'clock in our time. So that would put you at about three o'clock in the morning. So you might not, uh, well, not three, about one o'clock in the morning. So you might not want to catch the live show, but we usually post the next day, the, the, the lecture is on YouTube. Um, we've also done some things where we go online. And so we developed a, a, a scale of the uh, sort of a power of 10 scale called quantum to cosmos. And you can take, uh, take a look through this. You can just scroll through from starting at a human scale, go back, 
um, and see bigger and bigger and bigger to the edge of the universe, or you can zoom into the Planck length. And throughout the scale, there's lots of opportunity to jump out and learn more about different things. Um, and we are constantly adding to this scale so that um, it's, a, it's a simple way to interact and to learn about what, what's going on in physics and to see, okay, this is kind of interesting. The physics at the smallest scale is also connected to the physics at the very largest scale. And that's one of the neatest things being here at Perimeter Institute is I work with these researchers who um, do particle physics, but they use the particle physics to address cosmology questions and scale of the universe things. And so that's, to me, is a fantastic uh, mix. And then we also have uh, created a full suite of materials for students and teachers to use. And this has been the, the, the thing that I have worked the most with is working with students, working with teachers. And so uh, one of our activities again with that is we have special day where we bring in um, about 200 young women to our institute and we um, give them an opportunity to meet female researchers and, and um, women who are working in science related fields from the community. We bring them in and it's kind of almost like a little speed dating activity here that you see on the screen where the students can ask their questions and, and see that, hey, this is, this is a possibility for me. Um, I had a, a really neat conversation a couple of weeks ago with a young woman who was in first year physics at a local university. Um, one of my students connected her to me and said, you really need to talk to this guy um, because she's a young woman in physics and she's a young black woman in physics. And she, we talked on the phone and she said to me, I, I've never, I don't see anybody who looks like me in my program. And so the first thing I did was say, well, I want you to meet this young woman named Estelle who was a postdoc here at Perimeter and I'd like you to meet her and and I connected them because it's so important um, that young women see that there is uh, opportunity for them in these fields. If we want to address this issue with diversity, this is one of the key things that we need to do is create those connections between um, one generation and the next. And so this is an opportunity for us to do that. We have this special day and it's been very, very popular day. Another program we have is called ISSYP, the International Summer School for Young Physicists. And this is um, our one of our flagship programs. We have been doing this for uh, almost 20 years now. And this is a very competitive program. Now, most of our resources are focused on um, the general public or to the classroom or to just sort of increasing scientific literacy on, uh, to everybody. This is a little bit different. This is for those really special kids. Um, as a teacher, I have worked with many bright students. I have had about five students go to ISSYP and many of them went on to, po uh, to postgraduate work. ISSYP is, is designed for the very brightest kids and we bring them in from around the world and it's a it's a really fun program for them um, we bring in 40 students we bring in 20 canadians 20 international 20 boys 20 girls and it is deliberately set up that way so that we can have well originally the way it worked was um, we always had an international student and a Canadian student room together at the university. It's two weeks in the summer. And this, for most students, it is a life changing situation. It is an opportunity for them to fly, to go as fast as they can. Um, the very first year, I remember a young woman turning to me during one activity and she said to me, she goes, I didn't know there were other kids like me because she went to a small high school and she didn't know that there were kids who liked astronomy. She thought she was weird because she was good at math and science. And ISSYP is an opportunity for these students to get together and to ex, uh, 
push each other to learn as much as they can. And one of the neatest aspects of the program is in the second week, we put them into mentor groups where about six or eight of them will work together with one of our young researchers on a specific problem. And it's it could be something about what's the latest ideas in dark matter or um, some years we've had really mathematical ones about different kinds of calculus. And it depends on what sort of the researchers, what they will do is go, I got an interesting problem that I'd like to, to put in front of these students and see if they can do it. And, um, and so it's, it's a chance for them to actually work on an intimate basis with one of our researchers. And they really get a chance to say, does this feel like something I want to do? And so many students come back and say, yes, it is. This is this is what I want. And it is a life changing experience for them. Um, not not every kid then goes off to theoretical physics. Some of them, many of them will go off into engineering or computer science or mathematics. That's fine. But they get a chance to, to try on. Um, research and it, they get a chance to actually push themselves where their normal classroom teacher probably has not been able to give them that opportunity. Um, the first, we started working with kids and then very quickly we realized it's not fair to the teachers because we would get these students in for the summer and we would teach them all sorts of stuff about quantum mechanics and special relativity and general relativity and then we'd send them back into their high school classrooms and we said that's just not fair to those teachers because they now have to deal with kids who have incredibly deep questions. Um, I remember one of one young lady who went to the camp. She was in my school. She came up to me and she had this research paper on black holes and she said, can you help me understand this? I'm reading this paper and I'm, I'm stuck on the math and I took one look at the math and I'm like, I can't help you. You that I haven't looked at that kind of math in 20 years, and even then I couldn't understand it. And so we realized we really have to also work with teachers. And so we have spent a lot of time uh, building up a teacher network. So we very early on decided that the best model for reaching out and, and spreading the news of physics was using a train the trainer model. So we work with a group of teachers who then works with an, a, uh, who shares the information with other teachers. And so we have this incredible effect to multiply our effort. And um, we have a one week camp in the summer called Einstein Plus. We've had over 400 teachers come in and we spend a week um, digging into some physics and saying, how can we teach this? How can we teach this better? what is uh, a clearer representation of these these concepts. We reach out across the world with this. Um, Einstein Plus alumni are all over the world. We have also helped uh, create teacher networks throughout the world. So in Scotland, we work with the IOP in the UK as well. Um, in Brazil, we worked with ICTP Safer. And so we've we've created teacher networks that uh, are, are using our resources and other resources and and trying to build the capacity of teachers around the world. Um, speaking of which, one of our workshops we're going to be offering um, in July. So this is evidence for climate change. This is something that I am very passionate about. And so this will be a, a workshop where what I will do is we'll we have a resource that has a whole bunch of classroom activities. So we'll work through those activities in a fairly interactive workshop. It's an, uh, an hour and a half long, and we will um, look at some demonstrations that are really simple and low tech, but are powerful and get the message across about what, what is the science behind climate change and why do we care? And this is a chance, so if you're interested, you can, um, there's a link in the, in the chat you can go to this, that website or you can email my colleague Tanya at uh, T Williams at Perimeter Institute .ca, and she will uh, send you to the right place to, to sign up. Um, we do all these workshops we've done during COVID. We've done dozens of these workshops and usually we, we do them live and in person. 
but that's changing as well. Now, how about these resources? Where have they gone? Well, the numbers are staggering. Every once in a while, as a teacher, um, I'm just wrapped up, wrapped up a 30 year career in teaching. And when I do the math, even if I think about it, okay, I've had 100 students each semester, that's 200 students a year, that's 6,000 students that I've probably worked with face-to-face uh, -face in my classroom. These resources that we have developed here at Perimeter are now being used in over 85 countries, and last year alone, it's estimated that over 10 million students use them. So when I think about that as a teacher, it blows my mind because the impact is huge. And we are changing the way things are being taught. One of the first resources we developed was one on dark matter. And since that resource has been put out here in Canada, as they have modified curriculums across our country, dark matter has been inserted into the curriculum because now there's a resource. There's something that teachers can actually access so they can teach cutting edge physics. They can teach new stuff. And part of that is because we're providing the resource for it and we're training the teachers and the teachers are going to the curriculum writers and saying, hey, we can do better than this. We can go beyond free body diagrams. Um, so these resources are a really great collaboration between teachers and researchers. And so when we are developing these, so for example, well, we just put out a, a one on black holes. We're in the process of, of revamping our, our particle physics um, resource. We sit down with the research, researchers and we, we ask questions about what are the basic concepts that you think um, aren't addressed properly in education regarding your research, you know, your area of expertise. What are the interesting things that, that we think we can attach? And we really work back and forth. And so as we start to develop our lessons, we, we test them with lots of teachers and lots of classrooms, but we also keep in touch with those researchers and say, is this still correct? Are we, because sometimes what we do as teachers, and I'm really guilty of this as well, we oversimplify things. And when we oversimplify things, we introduce misconceptions. We introduce things that are not um, quite as accurate as they should be. Or we, we build scaffolding that later is gonna have to be undone. And that's one of the things that we really are trying to address is this, is there a way that we can avoid having to unbuild the learning that people have? Sometimes in our effort to introduce concepts, we don't necessarily do them in the right order. And as a result, students build misconceptions. So one of the things that we're trying to do with our resources is to simplify that process and say, okay, as a researcher, what are the basic concepts that you're dealing with here? And as we work back through the curriculum, is there a place where we have introduced wrong ideas? Uh, fields would be a good example of that, a resource on fields. Um, the language that we have, the way we introduce fields is not great historically. So we're trying to address that in our, our resource. Um, none of our activities require expensive equipment. Um, early, early on, we, uh, we worked with a lot of teachers in developing countries. And one of the things that was came home loud and clear was don't, don't build fancy equipment stuff. So what you see here is with our dark matter lab, it's just a, a circular motion kit that uh, you're going to swing around your head. And to make it fancy, we stick a, a little LED on it. Um, general relativity, we use balloons or beach balls to teach about curved space time. Quantum mechanics, we, we use simple transparencies and sand and, and cups. Expanding universe, those are washers attached by elastic bands to create a toy universe. Fields is probably the most the fanciest equipment, and that's because it's got one rare earth magnet in there. And those rare earth magnets can be a little difficult to get a hold of. Climate change, we use water and ice. Um, and so these are some of the activities. Everything we do is really tested carefully in classrooms. We have, what we do is we use our teacher network and they, they 
test drive them in their classrooms and then they give us feedback and say these instructions weren't clear or this demonstration didn't really work and so we we constantly are modifying we are constantly into uh it's an iterative process we are always trying to make things better and better we now have over 20 full resource kits though that would have six or seven activities in often they have videos attached to them but we also have a whole slew of individual activities that you can find on our website. Um, all of this material, by the way, I haven't mentioned this yet. It's free. We don't sell this stuff. We, it's all freely available to you to download. Um, these resources have been translated. They, they're written in English, but they are translated into French, Spanish and Portuguese now. Um, the the not all the materials have been translated um, that takes a little bit of time some of our things like posters we have a, a, a set of posters they are not necessarily all translated but if you go on to our website you can see what is available in what language um, so i want to show you a quick little quick um, i'm just going to take a minute to show you one of our, our earliest um, demonstrations that we have that we use to engage students in the process of science and the idea of how do we do science. So what I have here is um, what we call our black box. And our black box is um, just a tube, it's, it's PVC piping and it's got strings in it. And you can see these strings are attached And it's not very exciting. But the interesting thing is what happens when you start to pull different strings. And you see this this activity here is one that absolutely draws students in. And I hate doing it online because one of my favorite parts of workshops is when I start doing this the workshop gets deathly quiet and everybody gets this silly little grin on their face because they're trying to figure out what's going on inside. You see, this gets at the nature of science. This is about building models and that's what science does. We build models. We as humans have this innate need to solve problems. And so we tap into that with this model. We have a whole activity where students um, work with these black, bo black boxes and then they build models. Then they share their models and challenge their models. And the idea is, can you explain what's going on inside that tube? Now, the beautiful thing about that tube is that there are many possibilities. Now, some of these pictures here don't work, but some of them do. And so depending on what exactly you want to do with this, you can go on and, and to say, OK, so we have these different models. How do we test these models now? See, this is science. This is what we're doing at the LHC. We are testing a model. We're not actually uh, observing nature directly. We're, we're doing is looking at models and saying, can my model explain the observations that I make? So I make a prediction based on my model, what will happen? And we're, that's what experiments are designed to do, is to test models. And we have had great success with this. This is something that um, teachers love. I have a set of four of them in my classroom, and each one is different inside. And that's a really important thing. We actually use this as an introduction to quantum mechanics because in quantum mechanics, one of the, the issues is we have really good observations. We know what's going on, but we don't actually know what's happening inside. And so that's the question. Um, can we look inside the box? No, we actually can't. Um, I, there are other groups out there that allow students to open up the box. That's not allowed in science. Our model of the atom has to stand on its own. We aren't allowed to look inside the atom. Okay, there are fundamental limits to what we can actually observe in theoretical physics. Yes, 
True, we are constantly pushing that limit down and down and down, but ultimately we can't look inside the box. What we have to do is be more creative and come up with better and more subtle tests. Now, um, I've got a colleague here, Michael, who works in France, and he's gonna talk a little bit about how he is using some of our resources. What you see on the screen here is uh, black boxes around the world. But I'll leave it to Michael now. Excellent, Dave, and uh, th thank you for that uh, excellent introduction to Perimeter and your resources. Uh, so some of you might know me already. I'm a Scientix ambassador for France uh, here in Paris, and I'm absolutely thrilled to have gotten to introduce Dave and Perimeter to the Scientix community. Uh, they're one of my all-time favorite places to go for teacher resources and professional development. And I just want to quickly highlight a couple of things Dave already said for the most part, um, but the idea that they've got the best researchers in the world or some of the best researchers in the world working really closely with teachers to produce uh, things that work well in the classroom, very low entry barrier, very low cost. Those of you who know me well already, some of you might have attended my webinar on low cost experiments with Scientix in February or some of the other stuff I've done like virtual science camps. And you'll know, I always look for whatever's the cheapest possible. Hopefully people already have in-house. And that's something that Perimeter always makes sure that like if they're going to share a resource with the world, teachers have got to be able to use it. And like something you look up tonight, you could bring into your class tomorrow. Uh, I'm going to mention two or three of my all time favorite ones because they've got a lot of stuff and it might be hard to know where to start with things. Um, so some of the best topics are ones where there's current research being done and there might not be other good resources for it yet. Um, one of my favorite ones is the one on exoplanets and how to model the transit method for detecting exoplanets. This one I've done with kids as young as like the last two or three years of primary school, but it also works well up to like grade 11, grade 12 level if they're doing some astrophysics as part of their program. Uh, and the basic idea of it is using a smartphone light sensor, and you can use Firefox, uh, Google Science Journal, uh, Physique, which Christoph presented uh, at a Scientix webinar in uh, April. Another great Paris thing going on there. Um, but using that to get a graph similar to what the transit method does, similar to what researchers are actually doing, as they're now discovering more exoplanets. Uh, a couple of other really cool ones. They have some new break breakout room ones. Uh, I test out one on, bl on uh, black holes in a webinar with them. Their, their webinars are awesome as well. Uh, and they have a new one that I think is coming up. Maybe Dave can confirm this. It should be ready September or so maybe uh, on particle physics. And it's great to have new resources on particle physics because it's something if if you guys teach it as well, you'll know there's not a lot of great resources out there for it. Um, and there's a lot of places like CERN has some good classroom activities that they publish through their school lab. But something I've, I've continuously like brought to their attention, argued with them, a lot of it is inaccessible for most teachers. Like uh, they come up with activities where you need dry ice, you need 3D printers, you and like none of that I have in my school. Most of you probably don't in your school. Um, so if you want something with a really low entry barrier and you're able to try it out even the next day, uh, I'd say definitely go with perimeter stuff. One other thing to mention for this, and Dave, we probably want to switch to the next slide, is that all of their resources are both easy to, well, almost all of them, are both easy to uh, differentiate and easy to modify. So. It's one of the only places I know where the stuff you can download, they'll give it all to you in Word documents because they know teachers like to mess around with things, change it either to add things in your own language, to adapt it to your own curriculum. Um, so they, they work in that flexible flexibility right into it. Uh, also with a lot of activities, they know that if you're not, well, if, if you're working with 
whatever curriculum you're working with, you might be bringing it into a very young class. You might be bringing it into a very old or advanced class. And so they have different versions of ones that are easy to adapt to whatever level you're teaching to. Um, and I like I teach, I coordinate gifted programs at my school from like five years old all the way up to 18 years old. So having a huge variety like that, some of Perimeter's activities have worked well with 16 year olds and six year olds like one day after the other. And there's very few other uh, places for resources that have that much flexibility. Uh, so it's been great uh, being able to um, bring Dave and Perimeter to, to share their things with Scientix. I strongly recommend you check out their webinar coming up July 14th. I'm yeah, I'm going to be there as well. Um, so yeah, uh, thank you again, Dave. It's uh, it's great uh, getting to help share what you guys are up to. Thanks, Michael. And yeah, we will have a, a um, with our revision of, of our particle physics resource. We are putting in a new breakout room. I'm actually in the process of reviewing the first uh, designed pages for it, and it looks awesome. So I think it will be a really good uh, activity. Um, just, to, just to point out what, what Michael was saying here with the, the material being differentiated. In climate change, one of the things we did in the climate resource is we, we tried to show, we use something called inoculation theory, which is expose the students to a little, a little bit of what people are doing to con cause confusion. And so one of the things that gets done in climate is messing around with scales of graphs. And so what we did is, is we have the main activity, we have different scales for different graphs and we asked the kids to kind of compare them. And part of the lesson is, do you notice that the scales are different? But we also recognize that that's a big stretch for some classes. So we also produced at the same time, this, the, the graphs with the same scale so that if, if if you don't think your students are up to the challenge of dealing with different scales, you can still do the lesson, but have the same scales and they will still come away with, with some learning. And so that's a big part of what we are trying to do. And as Michael said, everything that you put in front of a student comes uh, in a Word document and you can adapt it and change it as you see fit. Um, all of these resources are available at our website called resources.perimeterinstitute.ca. It looks like a store. Um, you, some people get scared that they're going to have to pay. It's only that we're using the Shopify platform. And so it looks like it's an online uh, store. You will have to create an account. When you create the account, by the way, um, we, have, we have pretty strict privacy rules. You can read about them. Um, you can choose to be notified about our workshops and about opportunities and new resources. But you can also just go in there and take a look around. You can see that uh, things are available in English, French, Portuguese and Spanish. There are resources, there are posters, there are um, other things like the breakout activities. Feel free to wander through and, and take a take a take a tour and see what we have. I'm really proud of all the material that's out there. And now it's some opportunity for Q&A. So I think Eddie is going to run this part. Yes, thank you very much, Michael. Thank you very much, Dave. It's been very exciting to have you here. And, uh, and I must admit, uh, as a bit of a science geek myself, um, and I was exploring your, the website and your resources, and it is very difficult to get, uh, very easy to get lost in there because you just move from one resource to the other and it's six o'clock in the evening and before you know it, it's 11 and you just have learned a lot of stuff. So I really encourage everyone uh, to go and check out the resources because they are amazing. Now, our, um, our attendees and our guests have been um, posting a couple of questions. They have been a little bit shy, but thankfully we were prepared. Uh, and we brainstormed a few of those questions for you as well. Uh, but we have Stella. Um, who is telling us that she would like to introduce modern physics to her school. Do you have any summer programs for teachers? Yes, so our summer program is called Einstein Plus. This year we're doing what's called online teacher camp. Um, and for one week we will have teachers online. Um, 
and we will go through some some basic stuff about modern physics. Um, we will cover some of the resources that are available that we have in and so we also we do have resources for special relativity, for quantum mechanics, for general relativity, um, for particle physics, and so and black holes, cosmology. Um, that's our, that's our strength, right? We're a theoretical physics institute. So our our resources started at that senior level, and we as we started to fulfill those needs, we then started going down to lower grades and introducing concepts at earlier earlier stages. So yeah, we do have that. Um, we've, we're just winding up our, our workshops for the year. So that climate change one in July is sort of the last one until the, uh, the new season in September. So if you go to the store and you sign up, we will notify you when the workshops come online in the fall. Cool, thank you very much for that. Um, so we've got another question here. Um, the um, people are wondering how the resources are created uh, and who gets involved in them. So you have discussed that a lot of it is created in house, but do you have the opportunity for external teachers and people who would essentially be using your resources to participate in the creation and design of them? Yeah, so we use our teacher network. So if you were interested in getting involved in this kind of resource development, you there's kind of you get involved in the teacher network that we have first, but those are the teachers that we go to and we would um, we would test material with them. Sometimes we ask if if we know there's a couple of teachers in our teacher network, for example, who have expertise in certain fields. Um, there's one gentleman in, on the west coast of Canada who knows uh, who's done graduate work in black holes and yet he's a high school teacher. And so he's somebody that we lean on pretty heavily when we did the black hole activities to say, OK, you know, help us generate some ideas. How do you teach this stuff? Because we know he teaches the, the these high end ideas. Um, and so, yeah, teachers can get involved. I'm what's called a teacher in residence. And so this is the, this is the, the ultimate job for a high school teacher is that perimeter will take me out of the class for a year or two and I stay here full time and work on developing resources. And I basically just take a leave of absence from my school. And so I, this is my third term back. And in fact, what I've done now is I've retired as a teacher and I'm now back here full time. But my colleague Sean will be back in his classroom in September. And so what we do is we try to always have a, a rotation of new teachers coming in with ideas. And so that's that's another way that you can get involved is as a teacher in residence. But that's a very small um, segment of the population. There's been about six of us so far. Great, thank you so much for that. Um, we'll have time for a couple more questions. Um, so a lot of the questions are always turning about inspiration because as you've rightfully mentioned before, it's really can be sometimes difficult to um, create that enthusiasm and that excitement very because they very simply because they are barriers um, to um, every age to every social situation. So what would be your main piece of advice to the student, to the teachers out there about how to really get students, younger students, excited about science? Um, I honestly don't think it's hard to get students interested in science. I think we as teachers get in the way. Um, students are innately curious. If I put this black box in front of students, they're they're in, like they're they're there. If I give them a quick puzzle to, to work on, there there's no mystery. They're they're engaged. Um, where the problem comes, and this is part of you know my experience with teachers is teachers are too consider concerned about rigor and content and knowledge and and that just kills that inspiration, that desire to learn. Now, one of the things that we focus on with our resources is conceptual learning. We do not get into the nuts and bolts and the heavy. Now we do with a couple of things. We What we try to do in our resources is have one or two of those activities, the cutting edge ones that if you've got really bright kids, you can say, hey, try this. But the majority of our resources are aimed at showing students that, hey, you can understand this at a certain level. We're not, we're not gonna show, throw calculus at you. We're not gonna ask you to solve a matrix. 
we're, we're going to say, hey, look, on a beach ball with some masking tape, you can do general relativity. And 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 so what we try to do is is when we boil things down, you know, there's there's a quote that everybody attributes to Einstein, Feynman, everybody else about if you really understand a topic, you can explain it to a seven year old. I think we really try to live that out here is to say our researchers understand the material so well that they can explain it to a seven year old. And so that's my job then is to translate some of this stuff into activities where students get the gist of what's going on. And and we don't get caught up with too much details. I think the, the we have to be careful about when we introduce rigor and, and detail, because if we do it too soon, it's kind of like fishing. If you if you pull the hook too soon before you got that fish, you're going to lose them. You really got to make sure the hook is is in there before you can reel the fish in. And I think that's kind of what what we do here is we're really concentrating on, on getting that hook and, and just really trying to in, get these students engaged in, in science and physics. <clears throat> That's an absolutely brilliant analogy of fishing and science teaching. Um, talking about how to communicate about science, um, you have on your website some uh, posters about famous female scientists, uh, which are pretty brilliant. And I was wondering, um, where, where do you situate art and culture in the communication of science? Do you utilize um, tools that aren't just necessarily uh, scientific experience to get students and children excited about science? Yes, in fact, before there was a teacher in residence, Perimeter had an artist in residence. So we actually have had artists in residence here trying to help uh, explore the, the world through the lens of art. Um, those posters are a great example. By the way, those are called the forces of nature posters. We have a breakout room attached to them so that your students um, can can learn about some of the things that these fantastic female scientists physicists did in a in a neat engaging way to escape from a museum sort of thing so that's another activity that's on the the, the website but yeah we um we explore we have events here where we explore um through music through art um, we have our own symphony like a lot of researchers are musical so we actually have a, a Perimeter Institute symphony of just people in the building who rehearse and then at Christmas they'll put on a little concert and stuff like that. So yeah, we, we definitely uh, encourage and, and try to understand how we can use art and culture and it's, it's a full mix of what we try to do, especially when we have our festivals. We, we really, we've had live theater here. Uh, we, we've done all sorts of things like that. Well, thank you very much for that. I might very well come and pitch a tent um, behind the Perimeter Institute and listen to the music as well as the science. Um, we'll do a couple more questions, a couple of brief questions, and then it's going to be time to close up. Uh, so um, let's see where I can find a good question there. There we are. Are there examples of scenarios of learning on how to relate these topics of STEM to the six to 10 uh, age group, because we have a lot of uh, teachers who are uh, teaching in that category. So we have developed some resources down to, uh, I think what we call our grade five. So that would be about 10 years old. Um, some of our resources you can take and adapt down to the level that you're at, the, the age group that you're at. The reality is, is science is science. Asking good questions, being curious. We have a, a, one of the resources is called Process of Science. And I would encourage you to take a look at that one because that's probably the most adaptable. And it's one that I know a lot of elementary teachers uh, or primary school teachers have used where they it, it, it has activity on how to ask a good question. It has ideas about how do you, how do you build a model? And so those are the kinds of things that, that we want to encourage, especially at the earliest ages, is um, observational skills, how to describe something, how to ask a good question about something. So we have an activity called Why Is It Like That, where we put out some really interesting pictures. And the whole idea is the we, we try to encourage the students on how to make 
different kinds of observations and, and describing different things about the picture. And so, yeah, we, we have most of our material is, is aimed at the secondary level, but we, we do have some material that can easily go down into and people like Michael would be able to help you out too, because he's worked, he's he's taken some of our material and adapted it to a younger audience as well. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. Well, it is now 6, 6 p.m., so we've been, we're going to be closing down. I want to very warmly thank both of you for presenting um, the resources available at the Perimeter Institute. Uh, it's been a great tour, and I'm sure we'll have plenty of our uh, viewers tonight who will be very much enjoying visiting your website and using your resources to get their students but maybe beyond just their students, maybe themselves, uh, excited about science. So remember to check out the website for the Perimeter Institute, which is available in the chat for still a few moments. Uh, do remember as well to go and sign up um, the um, form that will uh, let us know of your attendance so we can send you a certificate. It is very, very important. Uh, if you do not answer that form, you will not be getting a certificate. So. Get, keep that in mind. Uh, and one more thing, I will remind everyone to go and check out the Scientix website. Uh, you'll have our calendar of event with a few webinars coming up, but also with quite a few exciting activities around STEM education, science education, and all of our project and other uh, partner projects. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending tonight this webinar uh, on the Perimeter Institute. It's been a real pleasure having you, and I really hope that all of us at EUN, the European School Network, and Scientix will see you next time for a new science adventure. Have a lovely evening.